hey, this is Dr. Ruscio. Let's discuss a better model of functional and integrated medicine, the approach that we use and that we advocate for. And just as a little bit of context, a challenge for both doctors and patients is that the Google or other search engine algorithms show people more of what is popular, but not necessarily more of what is the cause of their problems, right? This is the, the Dr. Google problem. And this becomes even more problematic for those who are trying to perform their own health research. But what we can do, what we should do, is use biostatistics and prevalence data plus patient information in order to make healthcare decisions that are the most likely to help you, thus avoiding the pitfalls of asking your doctor for the drug you saw in a commercial or the contemporary equivalent of asking for a test or a treatment you read an article on or heard a podcast about. When we get this right, it leads to better results in less time and with less cost. So let's expand on this. Coming back to our operating principles, we've covered how the science really informs how to treat people, not labs, how many labs are inaccurate, and how we get far better results when we treat the person, not the labs. So three other principles here really to round this out. An order of operations guides decision-making based upon data, not based upon emotion, the Google algorithm, or advertising. And keep in mind that much of what you may read could be advertising masquerading as education. Fifth principle, lab results are usually one fourth of the data needed to make a healthcare decision. And we'll give you some specific outlining of that in a moment. And number six, really we'll, we'll show you a side by side comparison for how weeding out unnecessary testing reduces costs and improves results. Okay. So an order of operations guides decision-making based upon data, not on emotion, not upon the Google algorithm or advertising. Here's a simple biostats example. Hypothyroidism affects one or less than 1% of the population. IBS affects 15% of the population. Either condition can cause fatigue, depression, and or constipation. However, if you search fatigue, depression, or constipation, and hypothyroidism is a more popular search term, the Google algorithm will show you more articles on hypothyroid than it will on IBS or on gut health. I'm just using IBS as kind of a stand-in for gut health. The idea of thyroid might sound appealing, but this doesn't mean it's the root cause. Again, remember, the prevalence here, hypothyroidism, 1% or less of the population, IBS, 15%. So what we do to circumvent this problem is we organize a list of potential causes from the most common down through the least common. Conventional medicine does this. It's called a differential or, or, or a DDX. And this is something I think conventional medicine does quite well. And what we then do is personalize how we proceed through this order of operations based upon your history, your symptoms your response to treatment, and your lab values. This is what our model looks like. And I wanna to try to kind of tie this all together here. We could term the model that we use the diet, lifestyle, and gut health foundations model. Looking at this kind of inverted tree here in the upper right-hand corner, the real core, the, the items that are going to be the most helpful for the highest percentage of people are these dietary lifestyle and gut health foundations. So a paleo diet or another type of elimination diet, a low FODMAP diet, perhaps some fasting with lifestyle exercise, making sure it's not too much or insufficient or the wrong type sleep, emotional health and perspective. Some patients come in uh, very afraid of food or, you know, um, inculcated into thinking they are dependent upon supplements or afraid because they've been diagnosed with some erroneous condition based upon a lab that has almost zero validity. Uh, so the emotional health piece, just how we frame things or reframe things can be quite helpful. Probiotic triple therapy is another mainstay. And then some level of integration of elemental dieting. These are all good places to start. Okay. So as we start working down 
this core, this trunk, we're then seeing how someone's symptoms evolve. And it's that evolution of symptoms that really helps us identify what else can we do from some of these branches, right? So the, the core of the tree are the items that from a biostatistics perspective we know will help the most people. The branch items can also help people, but we need additional context to determine which branch do we navigate, right? We don't want to just give everyone HCL plus enzymes, plus antimicrobials, plus binders for mold, plus thyroid support, plus female hormone support. It's too much, okay? So outlining a few examples of this, as you start working through the trunk, your clinician will be attentively looking at how your symptoms evolve in juxtaposition to your information, your symptoms and your history. And let's take one example of hydrochloric acid. If you have a history of autoimmune conditions and anemia and you're older, these are all historical factors that put you at increased risk of low HCL and therefore benefiting from HCL supplementation. And let's say that you've had this treatment response from going through that core of a elimination of bloating and constipation but you're still having these symptoms that are non-responsive of heartburn and indigestion. This would make you a, a, a real candidate for HCL. It would really strengthen the rationale and increase the likelihood that you would respond. And by the way, there's not really a good lab marker for HCL. Now, what about pancreatic enzymes? Let's say you've had a history of pancreatitis, diabetes, and you have these symptoms that have not responded of, of bloating and loose stools, plus potentially a lab of low fecal elastase. So again, as you proceed through a few visits initially with your clinician and work down the trunk, your clinician will be analyzing all of this and determining, is this a branch that we pursue or not? Antimicrobial therapy. Oftentimes, this is something that's kind of thrown out to people, I think, far too quickly. And we discussed in our last video how the response rate to the uh, antimicrobial or antibiotic rifaximin goes from about 50% to about 85% when you use probiotics plus the antibiotic, right? So this is all the more reason why we work down the core and then we determine, do we go to the branch of antimicrobials or antibiotics? So let's say historical data is you have a history of SIBO or maybe H. pylori and your treatment response has been your gastrointestinal symptoms are partially improving, but there's also unresponsive fatigue, brain fog, and sleep issues, you know, plus or minus certain lab findings, like maybe a retesting of SIBO or a retesting of H. pylori. And all this can be used together to dictate, do we want to go down the branch of antimicrobial therapy? Or what about abdominal massage? There have been some studies that have found that abdominal massage, just self-abdominal massage, free, easy, and cheap, can help people who have otherwise non-responsive constipation. There's not necessarily a, a historical finding here, but the symptom of constipation that has been non-responsive to other therapies, and there's also not a lab finding. So if you fit this profile, then a recommendation for abdominal massage could be given out. But keep in mind that many people will see constipation improve when they change their diet, if they start exercising, if they use probiotic triple therapy, and perhaps if they do a reset with elemental dieting. Okay, so again, this is... You know, so important to articulate that the process of monitoring your symptoms and looking at how your symptoms evolve in juxtaposition to your personal information helps your clinician determine what branch that we go to. And female hormones, another good example. If a woman has a history of female symptoms, perhaps some starting post hysterectomy or symptoms starting postmenopausal and she's having these symptoms of PMS or cycle irregularities, or maybe hot flashing and fatigue and mood swings and brain fog. And as you work down the trunk, there's only been a partial response to other therapies. That's a good time to pursue female hormone supports. But we don't want to jump right to this branch because many cases of female hormone imbalances, or at least the symptoms of them, will resolve once we work through the trunk of our model. And because, at least for the herbal treatments, and you can also make the same argument for low-dose bioidenticals, um, because the herbals most namely 
act in a corrective fashion, labs really aren't required because it doesn't matter if the estrogen is a bit high or low or the progesterone is a bit high or low. The herbs tend to be corrective or somewhat adaptogenic. So another example of the limited utility of labs. Okay, so that's just a few examples um, of how this process works. Okay, so take the tree, flip it upside down so it's the trunk and then the branches. That is constructed based upon biostatistics, meaning what are the most common causes of symptoms and then what are also there but less common. And that's kind of the, the overall guiding structure. And then your history, your symptoms, your response treatment, and your labs help us to navigate you through this model successfully. This is how we're able to be very precise, not have a high lab bill, not waste a lot of time, and also uh, effectively personalize care and keep the cost low. One thing I'd like to point to from these past examples is that labs were only helpful for a small number of those cases. And this brings us to principle five. Lab results are usually one fourth of the data needed to make a healthcare decision. We personalize care based upon four things predominantly, history, symptoms, treatment response, and lab work. I really hope that helps you see that labs do have a time and a place, but they should not be looked at as the preeminent guiding factor, but rather one fourth of the information needed in addition to a lot of information about you as a person that helps guide clinical decision making. And this then leads to the, the question of, you know, guess what happens when you weed out these unnecessary tests? Better results in less time and with less cost. And that leads to point six, weeding out unnecessary testing reduces cost and improves results. And just as an example, we pulled a few um, different clinics, initial lab bill uh, bills from the internet. And what you see here is that the treating the test model you can see $3,000 to roughly $8,000 of lab testing fees, whereas at our center, we come in at either zero for some cases or about $900 for others. And this correlates to the average number of supplements. This is more of an estimation from what we hear from our patients, but um, not unusual to start off with 12 supplements at some clinics, and we start off at three. And then the follow-up testing can be $500 to $2,000, and in our clinic, it's usually uh, nothing to $350. So in recap, these operating principles that really guide our clinical model and the care that we provide for you, the scientific literature tells us how to treat people, not numbers. Many labs are inaccurate, even fraudulent, and should not be used. Treating the person leads to far better results. An order of operations guides decision-making based upon data, not on emotion or the Google algorithm or advertising. Lab results are one fourth of the data needed to make a healthcare decision. And by weeding out unnecessary testing, this reduces the cost and improves the results. So I hope this short series has been helpful for you to understand what we do and why we do it and what the evidentiary basis underlying what we do in the clinic is. And I, I want to really close by, by um, leaving you with the fact that as you work through the trunk of the model, the amount of analysis that we are doing on the back end is immense. We have an ongoing list of those potential problems, and at each visit, we're making notes, we're moving things up the list, or moving things down as your uh, symptoms evolve the treatment. So uh, even though we may not boast the, the longest follow-up visits, it's because we're doing a lot of the, the crunching pre and post visit to continue to personalize the care to you. And this is why I'm, I'm so happy with the results that we've been getting. And uh, it really does seem to be resonating with both doctors and patients. And again, I hope that this outline helps you better understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and, and really a lot of the hard work that we're doing behind the scenes so we can come to a visit prepared and best able to help you navigate through the trunk and then to the right branch if any is needed for you. Okay. This is Dr. Ruscio, and I hope that helps.